mothers. Good evening. Always a pleasure to come back to Lev Aaron and Yerushalayim Ira Kodesh to see boys from USA coming or from Europe coming here, sitting, learning, growing, changing their life for the better. It gives me great pleasure. Everyone who loves Hashem has to love everyone who is a Torah scholar. It has to, it goes Haber Atalia. If you love Hashem, you love everyone who loves his Torah. As for Shalom, you don't like Hashem, obviously allergic to the Torah, as we can see here in Israel, or the Rishayim here in the government. All they do is break their head, how can they destroy the Torah more and more and more. You can rest for a minute. It burns, it burns their feet. You know, maybe they will pass without a new decree on the Torah, just like the Greeks, maybe worse. Maybe worse than the time of the Greeks. Every time I get here, the topic is similar. The topic is similar because when you have boys, 19, 20, 21, 22, obviously the Yetzirah is boiling in this age. And there are two things in the mind of the people. Main problem is, who knows what is the main problem? No? College. College. Very good. <laughs> Very good. College and when the time comes, Shiduch. If we gave this lecture when I was born, right? So if, you are, if the lecture was taking place now we in 2021, Leminyanam, if it would be 1980, the lecture would be a little bit different. Because back then, if people went to college, the goyim and the atmosphere was not as terrible as it is today. Today, to go to college, unfortunately, I wish it wasn't the case. It's mamash pikuach nefesh deoraita every minute. Pikuach nefesh deoraita. Why? How many dangers the Neshama has over there? First, almost all the professors in the world today are big Kofrim Reshaim, people of Sodom and Gomorrah, one by one. Evolution, there's no God, Big Bang, everything is, a, is coincidence. Lefties, abomination, all, all kinds of dirt want to modify the world, want to cancel the law of nature, wants to eliminate God from the reality of the world. The biggest, the head generals of the Sitra Akhra are the professors today of the university. So just to be among these Rishayim and to look at their face every day for a few hours is a knife to the heart. It's a mamash damage to the Neshama, because you're not allowed to look at the face of Adam Rasha. Now, there's two kinds of Rishayim. One kind of Rishayim, unfortunately, it's almost everybody in the world, even people who learn and people who keep Shabbos, who keep mitzvot. They have uh, Yetzirah of Te'avot, Le'te'avon. It's called Rishayim Le'te'avon. People love money, people love uh, food, women, all these things, sport, which takes them away from Hashem. The Averos that people do, the Te'avon, is not because Khalila they deny Hashem existed, or his supervision, or that they don't understand that he watched them and records them. Every Talmud Matchil knows, Ayn Rav was in Shomar, B'chol Ma'asecha Basetur Nikhtavim. Everybody knows Hashem is watching, but the Yetzirah managed to make us forget it from time to time. Especially when the desire on a rise, it's like a drug addict. The man that he meets the drug, he'll kill his own mother. If you ask him when he's sober, do you love your mother? Of course, I'll die for her. So how come yesterday you try to kill her? It wasn't me. The Satan took over, I don't even remember. I mean, my body needed this desire. That's it, I'm an addict. 
Now, there are, we are aware of alcohol, alcoholic or drug addict, or this kind of addicts. Well, you know, you hear about it a lot, but each one of us is an addict in a different way. One is an addict of sport, one is an addict of uh, his phone, one is an addict of food, one is an addict of girls. Everybody has his own sickness. We all came to the world with uh, at least one sickness, otherwise Hashem wouldn't put us here. See, the Baba Sali didn't have to come back again here for another Gilgu once he left the world. What else does he have to fix? He gave his life for the Torah, for Hashem, for Kedusha. It was 45 kilo. 45 kilo. Did not enjoy from this world, it was a different level of a, of a, of a human being. At such level of Kedusha, and many others, Baruch Hashem, he wasn't the only one, there were many other big tzaddikim, Talmidei Chachamim, Rabbi Yashir, Rabbi Tzion Abba Shaul, Rabbi Ovadia from across the street, Rabbi Wozner, many Gdolei Olam, that reached a very high, the highest level you can reach in this generation. Maybe 900 years ago, they wouldn't consider Gdolei Ador, but compared to now, each one of them is like the Rambam, Rashi, the Ran, Rashba, same ratio. Like the, like the Gemara said, Iftach bedoro ke Shmuel bedoro. Can you compare Iftach to Shmuel? If Iftach was at the same time with Shmuel now, he wouldn't be able to even prepare tea for him. He said, can I come and be Meshamesh Shmuel? Shmuel shakul ke Moshe ve'aron. I just want to make him tea, coffee, you know, to wash his uh, clothes maybe, help him out whenever he needs for his personal errands. He said, no, no. We have to choose someone in a higher level for Shmuel. Why? Because it would be Shmuel. Shmuel, who can reach Shmuel? Aval, in his generation, that's what he, that's what he had. And to, in today's generation, this is what we have. And by the way, in the eyes of Hashem, it's nothing less than Gdolei Olam that lived a thousand years ago. Especially in such a filthy world that we live in today, to reach a level like Rabbi Yashiv in this generation, it's nothing less than the Rambam or Rashi in their days. Don't forget, in the time of Rambam, Rambam worked the entire week for the, for the Muslim Arab king of Egypt. He was his personal doctor. The Rambam writes, all day I'm serving Arabs. From morning to night I take care of Arabs. Same Arabs you have today, same Arabs you have 800 years ago. They have one thing in their mind, slaughter all Jews. And you have to take care of them. Here, you know, you know, and sometimes you, you take care of different going, like in New York, if you're a doctor, not all of them want to slaughter you. Some of them hate you, some of them okay with you. They don't look at them as different than others. What's the Safsonel Yaakov, general rule, is an exception to the rule sometimes. But he was working with kind of people that almost every patient, if he could, would slaughter him, if you would see him on the street. He has to take care of them. The biggest Gdol Olam, Gdol Aposkim, has to take care of these people over there. And when did he learn his Torah? On Shabbat. Shabbat he had off. He writes, the Rambam writes, today, all day, I did not have time to eat something. Because all day I was taking care of these Arabs. So how did he become Rambam? If somebody today would only learn Torah on Shabbat, he would be Amaharetz de Oraita. Gamur. Who can reach anything with learning Torah one day, one day a week? You learn today six days a week, and you barely reach any level with today's Nisyonot. Uh, but in the times the Rambam, everyone was dressed. Women were dressed like human beings, not like today what's happening in the world. You live in a safari today. <laughs> it's not anymore a world of human being. You know, sometimes you go to the Bronx Zoo, you're not sure what side of the fence are the animals. <laughs> you, look to the right, you look to the left, and you wonder, I mean, people, the, the, the monkeys not get dressed, and the people there is also not get dressed. 800 years ago, you had the same thing. I once put a picture on my page of, uh, of the beach in South Carolina in the year 1900. 
120 years ago. What is it, like five, six generations ago? Four. You had to see the Goyot. The Goyot It's another place of Jews. Beach. Everybody there were not Jewish. The, the way they came to the beach, like a wedding gown. <laughs> cover from head to toe, cover the hair with a hat and a net covering the face and an umbrella in case a crazy guy would pass by and would look, they would put down the umbrella. <laughs> Extra safety. <laughs> South Carolina Beach, 120 years ago. Goyot. How do they go to the water, the goyot? They want to go into the water. There's no such thing bathing suit. So what do they have in the water? They have like cabins. It's like a room, wood, with a cover, like a shed. You open the door, you go inside, take off your clothes, hanging it. Swim inside, surrounded by four walls. Get a towel, get dry, get dressed, and come out. This is the goyot. Now you understand how the world was destroyed. I saw a picture in Manhattan, a video. In Manhattan, you know, now they make it in colors. Originally it was black and white, but they make it now in colors. It looks so real, streets with the same buildings that now exist in Manhattan. But from 100 years ago, from 90 years ago, you had to see thousands of people walking in the street. You will not find one woman that is not fully dressed, modest, according to Jewish halacha. Not one. So when you live in such a generation, you're not pogemine inai. Also, the avira on the street is not as bad as now. Also, the level of the people is not as low as now. You can achieve, you can achieve a lot. Food is better, everything is better, everything was more simple. Less ta'avot, a homer. Most places there is no electric, you come home, there's nothing to do. What are you going to do? You come home in the evening, you have a little lamp with oil, and you learn. All night you learn. Sit with the Gemara and you learn, there's nothing else to do. Women did not even go to school. Women didn't go to school until two generations ago. There was no such thing, girl, schools for, for, for girls, until Sarah Schmierer opened Bet Yaakov. Girls did not go to yeshiva. That's why the Gemara says, if you want to get married to a girl, check who her brothers are. What's the connection today? You have a girl that she's from Bet Yaakov, extremely smart and modest, and her brothers are all bombs on the street. She has to suffer because she has such brothers. She's perfect. She's devoted. She's a lover of Hashem. Her parents are also good people, but what can she do? She has two, she has two brothers and they're off the derech. Because of that, she's not a good girl. Today, the brothers are any indication about how the girl is going to be. No connection. She has her own world. She's allergic to them. She, she herself suffering being together with the same house with them. Why does she have to be punished for their choices? But back in time, since women did not go to school, the only Torah they learned in Halacha and to read and write was from their brothers. Because they didn't go to school. So the brothers come home from Yeshiva and they do Chazar or Nekmara or learn Halacha. So she hears Torah in the house and slowly, slowly she learns how to read and she learns Halachot and she learns what a woman needs to learn. And if her brothers are Bnei Torah, she probably a good girl. Why? She had good influence. But today, the girls don't learn the Torah in the house. They learn it in Yeshiva. It's a different world today. So, Abutai, to go to college, not only is it Pikuach Nefesh, it's Vada'i to destroy your Neshama. Now, I'm telling you from 26 years of experience, you know, if you know me a little bit, you know that I have about six, seven thousand lectures online in Hebrew and in English, and some of them are three, four hours. So there's thousands of hours of Torah. And I've been all over in so many different countries and so many places. And I'm telling you from experience without offending anyone, there's always an exception to the rule, yes. 
if you are asking me what percent is the exception of the rule in this case, 10%. I can say from experience, you don't have to believe me, you may have a different experience, I don't know, but I'm, I'm going deep, I analyze what I see. I don't just see something and ignore. I like to understand why it's like this. And I go to the root of the problem. From every hundred people that went to university that I met in my entire time, include Haredim, with beards, with kippot, Shomer Shabbos people, 90% of them bevadai are kofrim gmurim. With no doubt in my mind. No, they are believers. They believe there is Hashem. Or why would they put a kippah on? Or tzitzit, or keep Shabbos. If you don't believe in Hashem, don't keep Shabbos. They believe in Hashem, but they modify the Torah according to the garbage that they taught them in the university. First of all, they deny the 13 principle of Judaism many, many times. For instance, how many times people butchered me for just mentioning the word punishment? People would consider orthodox or, or Muslim orthodox. They call themselves orthodox, not talking reform. Reform is a, it's an honor. Let them butcher me all day. The more they do, the better I am. But, but it hurts to see orthodox people do the same thing. From uh, conservative and reform, I don't have any expectation, obviously. But people who call themselves orthodox, when they hear that I speak about the punishment, or I read a verse from the Torah that Hashem said, Michal el Shabbos mot yumat, they go crazy. They're ready to kill me for reading a pasuk that appeared in the Torah 12 times. How is it possible? How is it possible? How people that call themselves religious get angry when there is a pasuk in the Torah that are read next to them and they are allergic to the Torah? They want to redesign the Torah according to their own convenience and the brainwash they went through in university. They push the venom, the poison of the kfirah, of the heresy, into their system and these people will never ever be righteous again. Me'uvat lo yuchalit kon. Very rarely, very rarely, you find someone that was few years in university and was able to move on and not get hurt from the heresy he heard over there. Or from the type of people who sat next to him in a bench, if you know what I mean. Online. Oh, online is a different story. The question is if there's heresy there or not. Remember, there's two, there are two issues here. One is the goyot and all the other metoavim over there, people of abomination that you have to sit with them in a class for four years and look at their faces and hear their voices. It's already a disaster for you, Nishama. But let's say you are online, you don't really see them. You only see the professor who will say you're allowed to look at his face. He's also one of them. Who are this professor? Professor for math, professor for history. Where does he go when he finishes college? To his husband. So where does he go? <laughs> you want to look at the face of someone like that because you want to learn a little math? <laughs> That's what the world has become. The problem is that almost all of them are lefty, democrat, wicked reshaim, haters of holiness. And not only, they're not passive, they're very active. They force their rotten opinion on everyone. Freedom of speech exists only by lefties. <laughs> No writers have any right to say anything. Not only in America, here is the same story. Anytime someone wants to say something in the name of the Torah, they cut it off in the editing. I have a lot of uh, famous celebrities, what they call here, that are in touch with me. And every day on the television, I make them more, like, more and more religious over the time. And I always tell them, use the stage you have to push Jewish agendas. Why can you never say a word about the purpose of life, something recommended as a good film for them to watch? <laughs> so one of them told me, ah, Rabbi, you're very naive. You still don't know what's going on here on television, huh? All of the people over there, one by one, are people of abomination. And even if I say today in the morning when I put on the feeling, they cut it in the editing. 
But I speak about myself, that today Nachti Tfilin, they cut it out. Why? He's a man of influence. There's a lot of teenagers follow this singer. So if he say, I put Tfilin, maybe a lot of Chilonim kids would say, oh, you know what, I also have Tfilin. If my hero puts Tfilin, let me also put Tfilin. They know it, this Metoavim. Immediately they run and cut it out. And they get warning. Ravuri Zohar is the Baal Tshuva of the generation. The Baal Tshuva of the generation. Why? First of all, when he became a Baal Tshuva... He was a movie star. Yeah, he was a movie star. He was a movie star and a director, very famous, had TV shows, and he was a host in many shows. Even in Hollywood, they offered him to enter over there the, the show world. And in his days, like 40 something years ago, when he became Bad Shuva, it wasn't like today. Everybody has non stop uh, CDs, USBs, books. Everywhere you go, you, you hear Torah, you can get as plenty of things. You, there was nothing in his time, nothing. Just it was one of the first times. You know, so one time, because he was still such a famous person, 20 years ago they gave him a talk show on secular television. And he's hosting people, his friends from the past. All these Rishayim, he's now a tzaddik, he has to speak to all his former friends that stayed wicked. So they want to see, he's going to bring raiding. So they, you know how they have a little earpiece in the ear. He's very, he's, he's not, you know, he's very honest. So every time he was saying something, he said, oh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to say it. They, they scream at me in my earpiece. I'm not allowed to say religion. No, no, I'm sorry, forgive me. And this is in the middle of a show. Meaning in one show, 20 times they say, we, we agree that you're not gonna, you're not gonna bring much people to become religious. Uri, we agree without saying Shabbat. Uri, why is it feeling? You're breaking the rule. This is who runs the country now. People that sit in the government. In a, you know, we today now live in the middle of the prophecy of the Gemara in Masechet Sota. Namash, the Gemara gave Nevoah. In the end of the, the Gemara describes what's going to happen before the Mashiach would come, the Gemara concludes, meaning, until that time, you will be able to count on Hashem and His messengers. Hashem will have messengers. So you will count on the Rabbi, you will count on the Dayan, you will count on, the, you know, good friend, you will count on many people, you will count on the government, you will count on the police, on the army, you will count on many, many things. Obviously, the main thing will be Hashem, but you will also trust the police to protect you. You will trust the army to save the country. You will trust the Air Force. You will trust the, uh, trust the police protecting your house from robberies. You will trust the government that they really want something good for your country. Now, these days are over. You cannot trust anyone. In case you think that you can trust the Israeli government or the United States government, let me tell you something that you understand. The, the deputy of the head of the Mossad, you know the head of the Mossad, it's like the CIA, but of Israel. CIA, they have spies all over the world. The Mossad has an external army, thousands of spies and murderers and people who run and go and try to kill Iranian scientists that try to make a nuclear bomb to kill all of us. So the head of the Mossad, he knows secrets that if the enemy will get it out of him, that's the end of us. They know the spies, all the people, where they are, submarines, this, you know. And also they have uh, goyim, but they pay the money and the goyim cooperate. It could be a senator, it can be some uh, minister. If they find out all the secrets, there will be a disaster. So the, the vice president of the Mossad, three weeks ago he said in an interview, I think it's about time that the head of the Mossad will be an Arab. You understand what morons we're dealing with here? 
is, our life is in the hand of this idiot. He wants to give the, the, the cheese to the cat and say it's about time the cat will, will guard the cheese over here. How can you be that dumb? You cannot be a spy or a head of the CIA if you're a stupid person. I'm sure they have good education, I'm sure they have degrees, life experience, it's not a little kid. How can you be so stupid? How can someone that went to a lot of education through his life reach such a level that is dumber than a shoe? How can it be? What does he want? That the Arab will find out all the secret and give it to Iran and all of us will be dead the next day? He's willing to take that risk? That's the brainwash of the lefties in the university. They turn you into complete, not rational person. You will wait and see. Those of you who will not take my advice and will still go to university, remember my words. Four or five years later, you're going to see that everything you learn in this holy place, and right now you admire the Torah and you're full of fire and you're willing to go and be a servant of Hashem and have a holy life. In five years from now, if you sit over there, you're going to be the exact opposite, 180 degrees to the other side. What about Yeshiva University? No, okay? dif no difference between this university to the other. There's no difference. All university have kfira. I want to remind you that people that came from that place, one of them say in speech that homosexuality and feminism is a wonderful development to humanity. I want to remind you that people that came from that place say things that if you would hear it from a secular person, you would faint. But because they came from that place, it's no problem. Why? Because it's called Yeshiva, or it's called Shabbos. They find nice names, these places. So, universities, it's a place of kfirah. There's nothing you can do about it. So, the question is, if there is a way to learn something online without being exposed to kfira, if there is such a way, I'm not an expert in every possible way, do it. It's not a crime to get a profession and make your own living as Ben Torah. It's not a crime. The question is, in order for you to gain secular studies and get some kind of a job one day, do you have to go through four or five years of heresy every moment? Who gave you permission? You gave me I tell you something, my daughter wanted to be a doctor. She had very high grades. I told her, don't do it. She said, why? I said, let me tell you the life of a Jewish doctor. Nobody thinks about it. Let me refresh your, your memory in case you forgot. Uh -huh. If you are a Jewish doctor in America or in Israel, right? That's most of the Jewish doctors are either in the United States or here or in England. Europe. Okay, let me see the life of a Jewish doctor. Religious. Wakes up in the morning, go to Shachrit, finish Minyan, maybe learns Daf Yomi, and runs to the hospital. From morning to night, let's say he works 10 hours a day, okay? And he sees 50 patients per day, let's say. Plus operations and other things and emails from patients, what to do, you know. He has to take care of his patients. If it's in New York, from the hundred patients that come to him now, how many of them are righteous? If he's lucky, one or two. First, you have tons of Arabs, anti-Semites, who wants to slaughter all Jews. You gotta take care of them. You have Nazis with swastikas. They come, you have to take care of them. You have Pakistanis, you have to take care of them. You have Indian who bow down to the cow. You have to take care of them. You have a lot of gays. You have to take care of them. You have to make their life better that they can continue to do crimes against Hashem. So your entire work is helping wicked people to continue to rebel against Hashem. Why would you want to be a doctor, you tell me? What about the Jewish people? Wait. If there was a way to be a doctor in Haredi community, now 100% of your patients are Haredim, be a doctor. 
then I would strongly recommend it. Good, you, you deal with chesed all day, and you take care of Shomre Shabbat, of Talmidei Chachamim, but you know in America, I cannot tell a go, I'm sorry, I cannot take care of you. Once you open a place, every patient walks through the door, he must take care of him, or in a hospital. So it's not so realistic. Now I'll tell you, one time I went to visit someone in Be'er Sheva Hospital. Here in Israel. I saw over there 300 people in a hospital waiting, sitting outside. All of them were Arabs. Bedouin from Be'er Sheva. Be'er Sheva Hospital, 90% of the people who are treated there are Arabs who called for our death. The Bedouin of Be'er Sheva, they took over, they shoot, they, they robbed. You gotta take care of them. You are a Jewish doctor, all day you have to take care of these monsters. Why would you want such a job? Use your head. Why people want to be doctor? Two reasons. Either they are such a tzaddikim and they want to do chesed and help people help. Or they want to show off. I'm a doctor. <laughs> it's an honor. Wow, doctor such. I once called someone without saying doctor, he almost killed me. Doctor, uh, whatever his name was. <laughs> you know? So obviously he wants that title. That's what keeps him going. If you're gonna neglect his title, you're gonna be very upset. But the question is, I'm only using common sense. I'm not a politician. And I'm definitely not politically correct. <laughs> if you wanted a politically correct, you know where to find them. And you know me, have experience with me. You know me, I say everything as it is on the table, regardless of what people would say after I leave. The last thing I care about is the comments of the people. I come and I put the truth of the Torah on the table. I put what's right and what's wrong. Whether people like it or not, that's another issue. All right? So at least you know that's what's written. You understand? If you go to some Gadol Bat Torah and you tell them, I have to be a doctor, and 90% of my patients will be big reshaim that rebel against Hashem. Do you think one rabbi, serious one, will tell you it's okay, it's mitzvah to take care of these people? I want to remind you of the record that there are halachot in Shulchan Aruch that if you read them, you cannot even say it in front of a, of a camera. Uh, but just to give you a hint, Moridim, for those of you who understand what I say. So you definitely don't want to do, if you don't want to do what the Shulchan Aruch say to do, at least don't do the opposite of what the Shulchan Aruch say to do. Well, yes. Okay, fine. So, uh, you say a Jewish doctor, you wouldn't advise to be. It's not probably a good thing because uh, 95% of your patients are probably not going to be righteous people, right? A little bit slower, uh, a little bit hard for um, me to understand. You said that uh, Jewish doctor is not advisable thing to do because probably 90% of your patients are likely to be uh, not righteous pieces of people. Um, you can say weekend. It's okay. okay <laughs> So it's a nice find, Chazaka, that most people who call Atzala are from Jews, especially in Hendon. I was there, I know the kind of people who live there. I want to tell you something else, you know. In life, if a, if a stock broker offers you two stocks, one stock will bring you a thousand percent on your money a year, and one stock will bring you twenty percent on your money a year. Everybody knows that 20% is a very good investment. 20% a year doing nothing, just buying stock. I wish everyone would agree to such thing. Even Warren Buffett will agree to make 20% on his money doing nothing. Whatever he has, just sit and collect. It's a lot of money, 20%. The question is, if someone will come to you and say 20% is great, but I'm going to give you a thousand percent on your money. Which stock would you buy? Okay. Would you buy 50-50? 50% from the 1,000%, 50% from the 20%? That means you are brainless. <laughs> what kind of a person will do such thing? You have an opportunity to make, you have, let's say you have a million dollars. 
in the end of the year it's going to be ten million dollar profit. Why would you settle on twenty percent? Mm -hmm. Got it? Twenty percent and a thousand percent is a huge difference, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you got the point. If you got the point of what I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. but I'll clarify it. Atzala is a big mitzvah. You can even save life, you can relieve pain from people, you can help people deliver babies. There's a lot of great things they do, there's no question. We're not debating that being a Hatzalah person is busy all day with mitzvot. But that's 20% a year. Sitting in yeshiva and learning and becoming a Talmud Chacham is a thousand percent a year. Why leaving the Torah and going to be an Hatzalah driver or paramedic? And in case you're not convinced, the Gemara says it. Two people learn Gemara. Ruben and Shimon learn Gemara. Shimon is facing the lake. Ruben is facing the Aron Kodesh. From the window, he see the lake. So now, Chas Shalom, someone is drowning. You see somebody is drowning in a lake. Shimon quickly closed the Gemara, because he saw it. Ruben sits with the back to the person. Shimon got up and started to run, jumped into the water, swim, got that person, saved his life. The whole thing took 20 minutes. 20 minutes. The Chafetz Chaim, Chafetz Chaim, he did a calculation how many mitzvot a person earns per one hour of learning. The Chafetz Chaim said, you have an average person says 200 words per minute. And an average word has five letters. Average, sometimes more, sometimes less. So it's approximately 1,000 letters per minute. So each letter from a Torah or Gemara or Shulchan Aruch that you actually pronounce, each letter is mitzvah de writer. Each letter. So now, if you have a thousand letters per minute, that's 60,000 mitzvot per hour. Shimon just lost 20,000 mitzvot to earn one important mitzvah of saving someone's life. The problem is, you may think, wait a minute, the Rambam, the Rambam himself say that not every mitzvah is equal to the other. Some mitzvot equal like thousands. And some averot are also equal like big uh, thousands of sins, right? If a person is Michal al Shabbos, it's not equal to someone who did not do my machronim. You don't need to be a rabbi to know it, right? If someone is Michal al Shabbos, Michal al Shabbos areu ke goy lechol davar. Cannot even bury him in a Jewish cemetery. You have to make a fence between him and the other people. That's the halacha in Shulchan Aruch. Not only that, if in the old days everyone was Shomer Shabbos, you know, everyone was Shomer Shabbos in the old days. There's no such thing, Mechalele Shabbat in Faresia until 220 years ago in a Jewish nation. In every country you went, the entire community was Shomer Shabbos. So, in the old days, everyone was Shomer Shabbos, but sometimes people had anger, they had a fight. So somebody hit someone in the face and he died. Killed him in a fight. Or I don't know, took a, a, a stone and threw it in his head. Or pushed him from the terrace. And he killed him. He's a murderer now. Two witnesses testify and they have to execute that person. So they had a section that they murdered all, they buried all the murderers. One, two, three, four. Section of murderers. They all show their Shabbos. But they killed. He killed him and he killed her. Now by mistake, they buried among the murderers a Mechal El Shabbos. There was not a murderer. It was the nicest person in town. The nicest. A great doctor, teacher, ambulance driver, whatever you want to call him. Everyone likes seeing him in such nice middle. But it's Mechal El Shabbos. Smoke on Shabbos, drive the car, whatever the case is. By mistake, they buried him among the murderers. Halacha! 
You must open up his grave and remove him from there. It's a huge insult to the murderers that they bury among the Mechal and Shabbos. Because Shulchan Aruch say, and kovrim tzadik im rasha, ve'en kovrim rasha gadol im rasha katan. You do not mix between righteous and wicked in a cemetery, and you do not mix with a huge wicked one and a small wicked one. You have to separate between them. Why? The extra wicked people destroying the peace of mind on the people next to them. They have no rest. How did you dare such a rasha next to me? I wasn't so bad. Remember, that's Olam met over there. You feel it. You feel the pre oil rasha oil shcheno. There was uh, one Hasid, Vishnitz Hasid, that left the religion, went off the derech, and married a Goya. Something like this. One time, many years ago, Hasidut Vishnitz in America was on a very, very negative balance, big. Few million dollars negative back then is multiplied by ten today. There was a big danger to their existence financially. What are we gonna do? We're in a, in a negative balance. We don't know what to do. One person say there was one that used to be a Vishnitz Hasid, is a billionaire, and someone actually told him that we're not doing so well financially, and immediately he offered to give five million dollars and close the entire deficit in one check. But he has one request, condition. What's the request? He wants to be buried next to the Rebbe. You know, they have a section when they have a fence around it, when the, the Rebbe's are buried, not everyone, just the Rebbe's. In a Hasidish cemetery. Everyone is there, it's Shomer Shab, it's Hasidim. But they have a section of the Rebbe's. If you let me get buried next to the Rebbe, I'm giving you five million dollar a gift. The Gabbai of that time, whoever it was, Lo Amad Banisayon. It's too hard for him to test. Okay, that's what we're gonna do. Give us the check. He took the check, saved the problem, the financial problem. Twenty years later, this of the derech person passed. His family came, opened the gate. We have, we want to make a funeral then. Now it was a different gabari. So what? You want to be buried in this cemetery? You can't. It's against halacha. He wasn't Shomer Shabbos. He wasn't married to a Jewish woman. His, his kids are not Jewish. We cannot let you be buried in this entire cemetery. Forget about the section of the rabbis. But we gave you five million dollars for it. And not doing us a favor, that was the deal. Whoever made that deal with you made a big mistake. We will return to you the five million dollars. They, they paid him back the money because they cannot be bury him in a Jewish cemetery. They have to bury him on the other side of the fence. When my father, Allah Shalom, passed almost three years ago, first he lived many, many years in Batyam, then they moved to Rehovot. But by the time he moved, he was 74 already, and he couldn't walk three stairs, three flights up. There was no elevator in Batyam. So he moved to Rehovot next to my sister in a place that there is an elevator. <coughs> I was in the sixth floor. So obviously on Shabbat, he can now walk six floors. Three he couldn't. Six for sure he can. That's it. The only apartment he found next to my sister was in that building, and they have an elevator for the rest of the week. <laughs> so he couldn't go to Shul. He had to go in a home. The last two and a half years of his life, since he arrived to Rehovot, he prayed at home. So when he passed, my brother-in-law, me and my brother are in America, my brother-in-law and my sister are here in Rehovot. He calls me, I was Motze Shabbos, when we found out. In hearing it was morning already. Here it was morning, like eight, nine in the morning. He said to me, don't ask. I came to the cemetery here in Rehovot. Your father is entitled to get a grave in Rehovot. He's a citizen of Rehovot. But the rabbi of the cemetery say, I'm sorry, we're not going to bury him here. There is a big place over there, we'll bury him over there. Why? Because you have to bring us a proof that it's Shomer Shabbos. 
bring a letter from the rabbi of a shul that he recognizes him and he knows he's, he's not Michal Shabbos. He cannot let Michal Shabbos be buried in the cemetery. So if it wouldn't be me, somebody else would know what to do. I, had, I called some rabbis that knew him, and right away I arranged that letter. But without it, they would not bury him in a Jewish section. Bury him over there with the Mechalalei Shabbat. You understand? There's no tzchok, Rabotai. The halacha is the same halacha. We are not allowed to modify the halacha just because the world became modern. There's no such thing compromising on a divine information. There's no such thing. Oh, it's good that they do that. It's better than nothing. This approach is not legal. There is instruction from Hashem, and you have to elevate the people to the level of the Torah, not to bring the Torah to the level of the people. Because if you begin to trim parts from the Torah, you will become super reform. Remember, 200 years ago, the reform only changed one mitzvah of tzitzit. They said, ah, that's not relevant anymore. I don't have to tell you what they do today. Bar mitzvah, they put filin on the head of a dog. <laughs> didn't stop like that. It didn't stop like that. Mazal tov, putzi. Park mitzvah. Park. You have to see how they're excited. You come to a person and you say, how much is it tefillin, Rabbi? Good tefillin, everything became double now. Inflation, no. Ayoker hmm? Yamir, that's one of the conditions the Gemara gave. Everything became double. If you want to buy good Ashkenazi tefillin, as a reseller, not a, as a merchant, you pay more than $3,000 now. This parashiot of a good sofer is about $1,500. Very expensive. Baruch Hashem, Sfaradim have a discount, 30% less. <laughs> Everything became very expensive, but back then they paid $2,000 for that feeling, this reforming. One thing I never understood, they don't keep one mitzvah of the Torah, not even one, for sure. The question is, why would they buy an Ashkenazi Sefer Torah, which is about 20 to 30% more expensive than a Sfaradi, because it takes longer to write. So the question is, why such people would spend back then forty, fifty thousand dollars on few sifre Torah, each one of them, when they don't believe in the Torah? <laughs> would you spend fifty thousand dollars buying a Quran <laughs> when you don't believe in the Quran? Do you know anyone who do such thing? If a, if a Jew doesn't believe in the New Testament, <laughs> for me it's a napkin. I want to sell you this napkin for $50,000. She put it in your house. <laughs> what are the odds? Who would spend $50,000 on a Sefer Torah when they deny the exodus of Egypt? Mm -hmm. So there's no such thing. It's all fairy tales. One, uh, one chief rabbi of a famous country, chief rabbi of a famous country had an interview. And that is Chief Rabbi Rabotai, not Reform, Chief Rabbi, very well respected. The atheist interview him and he asked him, tell me, Adam and Eve, did it really happen? Or oh, it's a parable? He said to him, a parable. He said to him, and the Exodus of Egypt, did the Red Sea really split? Or oh, it's also a parable? Also a parable, he said to him, chief rabbi, consider orthodox. So the atheist, the Rasha, asked him, how do we know which parts of the Torah is divine and which parts of the Torah are parables? You sitting tight? Hold your chair. <laughs> he answered him, he answered him, every time the Torah contradicts science, it's a parable. If you know how Orthodox organization respect that speaker, that rabbi, you would faint if I tell you who he is. You would faint. This is the results of the universities. It would never happen to him if he wouldn't be so academic. The problem is that he invested 20 years in universities and read every book of every kofer 
and he got mixed with the Torah that he learned. The same one from England that said homosexuality and feminism is a wonderful development to humanity. He was, he was learning right here. Not far from here. It wasn't like that when he was 19, 20. But once he became academic, he's teaching now in England every day a series of the biggest heresy book to a student. Instead of teaching Torah, he's teaching Firah originally. And he breaks about it. And not only that, he comes and say, if you think the words of Chazal are musky, meaning rusty, moldy, I also think so. That's what's going to be out of you if you go to universities. You're nothing better than them. Remember, when they were your age, they were like you, full of fire for Gemara and Torah. They were not born wicked. Five years with Reshaim, twist your mind. Five years with Reshaim makes a permanent damage to your Neshama. So now the question is, you have to make a decision. What's more important for me, my Neshama and my Olam Abba, or how much money I'm going to have in my bank? I want to remind you that the amount of money you will make has nothing to do with the level of education you will have. Because King, King Solomon, Shlomo Amelech, already wrote, Lo Lechachamim Lere. Wisdom doesn't bring Parnassah. The dumbest people in the world are billionaires, and the most brilliant people sometimes do not pay the rent. And I've seen it all over. Even in secular studies it's like that. You can be a great genius mathematician making 40,000 a year in New York. And then you have some boxer who all he knows is to kill people with his punches, <laughs> make 30 million dollars in 15 minutes. <laughs> How many years the mathematician will have to kill himself to make what this monster from the neighborhood who knows how to kill people how many years the mathematician will have to work? 150 years to make what he makes in, a, in, a, in one fight. How many kids here in Israel made millions buying Bitcoin? They had no idea what they do. It was a few hundred dollars and he went up to $60,000. They became all rich. <laughs> They're buying watches that are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, here in Israel. Why? If Hashem wants you to make money, you make money. It doesn't mean you know what you're doing. A lot of people made money out of nowhere. And many people that are really, really talented, in the end, make nothing. Why? You have to beg to the one who owns the parnassah and divides the money in the world that will have mercy on you and give you your needs. That's it. If you think that by going against Hashem and sitting with the wicked people for four or five years, to gain some secular study knowledge will make your financial situation better. You are nothing but an infidel. Please do me a favor, don't dare to call yourself a religious Jew. Rabbi, which 5% were you talking about that, that are able to go to university and still be a religious Jew? I actually said 10%. So, we... I, I met, what's true, it's true. I'm not gonna modify the information. From every hundred people, ten people went to university, stayed normal. Stay religious, and not only that, they are vomiting from the dirt they saw over there. Do you have any examples? I've seen, I have, in Muncie, a few people, doctors, friends, that we dive in together, learn together, and you see, they have a very strong ashkafa. Are they still, are, are they still doctors though? Well, you know, remember, when they became doctors, the university was not like today. Remember what I said in, in, an hour ago? Yeah, it wasn't Pikuach Nefesh like today. I want to remind you that in the 70s, public school in the United States had separate sites for girls and separate guys for boys. I agree, Rob. But didn't you say that um, uh, the, the, the Rabbi you're talking about went to college and that's why and this is what happens here now? Where else did he learn to say such nonsense? Yeah, but he went in to Yeshiva? So he went to in Leva Aaron, they I teach you that there was no Adam and Eve? I agree. Do you know one yeshiva in the world that will teach such kfirah? So that means that he went to college in the 1970s, but you said college in the 1970s were different. But no, but he stayed academic until the last day of his life. That's why the secular British admired him so much. They don't admire me, you know. <laughs> yeah. They don't admire Avigdor Miller. 
תדון את מאי רב עובדיה יוסף, או רב ברבדה, או רב אלישיב, או... I give you a thousand names. Who they admire? Only כופרים. Only כופרים. Do you know? Do you know? Do you know? What's happening today in the world? If you see what kind of people who get a lot of respect, if you see the things they say, you won't believe. Even in a church, they don't dare to say such things. Ask an Arab here some of the things they say, and we want to kill you. <laughs> you kufar, you kufar, get out of here. Get out of here, you kufar, you need, to, you need to die, they will tell you. Imagine if you tell them you heard it from a very well-known speaker. You know, here in Israel there's a guy, his beard is all the way to the floor, and his pears sometimes get caught by the door. You know, when he walks. <laughs> if you look at him, he looks like, oof, such an inspiration. So he gets on the stage, and this is what he said. If your wife wants you to start your car on Shabbos and take her to the beach, you must do it for Shalom Bais. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I understand those who smoke grass. <laughs> this is the kind of clowns you have today. <laughs> you have to be very careful, Rabotai, Ashkafa. <laughs> Let me give you a great advice before I forget. Each one of you, if you listen to me, in Olam Abba, you will bless me for eternity. But it's nothing to do with me. I'm just giving you an advice. You want to be a big tzaddik with the perfect, pure Jewish hashkafa? Just buy all the books of Rav Avigdor Miller Zatzal and learn them one by one by heart. That should be the mission of your life. It's, it's the best treasure that was written in our generation. You have to see what a chacham without kissing up to anyone, without modifying anything, on every subject of Judaism, pure, exactly like Chazal. It's mamash like Rabbi Akiva speaking from his mouth. It's very rare in today's generation, because big leaders had a lot of influence, politicians, this, that, the community. It's big, big pressure you have. He said, the, the rabbis of Brooklyn loves me very much. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Every time I give my weekly speech, meaning Musa, half of the people get up and leave. And where do they go? To different synagogues in Brooklyn. So I supply to them a lot of governors. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. So, Prof. Hashem last year gave this advice, and I listened to Rav Vicky Miller, I loved him. He's awesome. But I listened to one of his tapes, it's called The True Truth. And in the tape, he says that sometimes the, the leaders of the community, they could, they could work their way to getting them to, to be, mm. uh, let's say, Shomer Shabbat, for example. He gives a story of Yisrael Salanter. Yeah. He says, first, he made sure there were, no, there were no one religious in the crowd. You tell him slowly, oh, first, let's not write on Shabbat. You have to make Manasai understand you can work on Shabbat. And slowly, slowly, you made them show me Shabbat. Oh. So how do we know the difference? Everything you say is uh, accurate, except one word what? that messed up everything. Oh. He did never, oh. ever in his life say to someone, this you can do for now. It's against halacha. You cannot tell Michalel Shabbat, okay, smoke, but not as much. Okay, we go, but you don't have to wait seven clean days in a mikveh. Two, it's enough. You're not allowed. No. You do not ever modify halacha. What you can say, what you can say to a person is try to lower the amount of averot you do. Not that you tell him it's allowed to do averot. No. Oh, so this is allowed, Rabbi? No, no, no. Absolutely, it's not allowed. But at least before you had isur karet and skila, and now you have only the rabbanan, which is also very serious. But at least, at least you lower the amount of sins. Don't ever say this is allowed for now. In your level, this is also good. That's a very big avera to say such thing. Remember, the Torah does not belong to each one of us. We are not the masters of the Torah. We don't have copyrights. Only Hashem has copyrights. No one is allowed to modify a word from the Torah. Whatever the truth is, even if it's not popular, 
Don't be politically correct. Politically correct equal a big liar. That's what it is. Don't make, don't do laundry to certain words making them sound and smell better. That's all a scam. Being politically correct, coming to people and say, well, if you come with a car for now, we understand. There's no such thing. You're not allowed to come to the synagogue on Shabbat with a car. And you have to speak about it. And if they stop coming, it's not, it's not my problem. Right? You understand why? Because if he's going to come 20 years to your shul with a car, it happened to me once. I spoke in a, in a shul in New York for about two years, almost two years, every week, weekly shul. I hope Hashem was very successful over there. All the young and professional became Shorei Shabbat. Mamash, everybody. It was a revolution in the community. And one time, I was uh, speaking over there about something that someone told me that there are people in this community who still come from far away with a car on Shabbos. And I said, I don't understand. You want a daven in your own kind of synagogue, meaning your nationality, which there are not that many in New York. So you come from half an hour drive on Shabbat because you want to join the tradition of your parents. It's very nice to join the tradition, but what happens if you have to do a sort of writer just for tradition of your parents? Where does it say that something like this is allowed? You're not allowed to drive on Shabbat. You cannot invest a million dollars to make a penny. It doesn't work that way. Doing Isurei Skila, every time you hit the gas, it's another Isurei Skila. Every time. So driving from Queens to Brooklyn or the other way around, it's about a, almost an hour ride. You have to press the gas probably 500 times. It's 500 Isurei Skila to come to do Mitzvah de Rabbanan. What? Where is your head? Who gave permission to such thing? So, the rabbi over there, when he heard that, he was still standing all the way in the end in the hallway with the president of the community. So one very rich guy and one very modern rabbi. They looked at me from far, big synagogue, full of people, and I'm ruining their plan now. Because they want them to come with the car on Shabbat. Because there's a lot of rich people, and they come on Shabbat, they do auction for the aliyot, and they buy it for thousands of dollars. If they won't come, these rich people in the car, they live in fancy areas, they won't come all the way to the shul, income of the shul will go down. So I see the, the rabbi over there, he goes like this. <laughs> like this. And I go even extra gas, I press the gas harder. <laughs> and the president said, <laughs> and, I, and I go full force to tell them what does it mean, Chalel Shabbat. What do you think happened? He jumped into the shul. Excuse me, we have a little emergency. Rabbi, we need to talk to you outside. Something just happened. They don't know, they didn't see it. They put the back to it. I get off the, in the middle of a lecture. <laughs> I went outside. Mom, what do you do? Why did you tell them this? I said, did I say something wrong? <laughs> but they had to drive on Shabbat. Of course not. But we never tell them anything. We don't, we don't tell them come with a car. But we also don't tell them don't come with a, without a car. Meaning, we pretend we don't see. So I said to them, I don't understand. Isn't it better that they pray where they live? Redneck, Five Towns, Brooklyn, Sfaradi, Ashkenazi, Hasidish, Kosher Shul, who cares what? In a Kosher Minyan, they have next to their house, they're gonna drive all the way to here just to what? For what? No, no, you have to go fix the mistake you made. I made a mistake. So now, I know what's gonna happen now. It's a big nisayon for me, for Hashem, because they're going to throw me out from the place. And I made, a, Baruch Hashem, a great avodah shama. So I got up on a stage, and what would you say if you were instead of me now? They're actually threatening you in a nice way, that you have to go and fix what you just say, meaning, tell them it's okay to come with the car. 
What would you say? No? Azov. So I tell you what I did. I got up on the stage and I said, Apotai, do you know what was the emergency? <laughs> 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 they just asked me to fix what I told you, that you should be able to continue to come with the car. And I just want to tell you, and they're still standing watching, do not listen to them! <laughs> Don't! They're not gonna be in your trial to defend you when Hashem is gonna punish you for all this Hilulei Shabbat. Don't listen to them. <laughs> you cannot drive the car no matter what un unless there is a life risk to come to this traditional community. It's a life risk? No. You don't have no permission. One time I was in San Diego, I spoke about why are you coming with a car? So one guy got up, a rich guy, got angry. I drive 40 minutes to get to this Faradi Minyan with my kids that the only thing they hear once a week, they're going to hear the Torah and they're going to hear a little speech from the rabbi. Now you're telling me not to come with a car? So I say to him, let me ask you a question. When Hashem gave the Torah 3,300 years ago, did he know the generation we lived in, in details? He said yes. Did he know you and where you're gonna live and the synagogue in San Diego and how far Jews would live close to kosher shoes? Did he know that? Yes. Did he know people would live far away from communities and people were used car to go to schools? It was something, uh, it's not something new to him. Hashem saw the world until the end, the last second of this world. So if Hashem knew that there will be thousands of thousands of Jews who live far away from a shul, they have no shul in the town, he saw everything and he still wrote in the Torah that the only reason I allow you to break Shabbat is for life risk, not for tefillah betzibur. That means praying together in a minyan does not justify Hilul Shabbat. If Hashem thought that it's so important, that it's more important than Shabbat, he would write in the Torah. There are two permissions to break Shabbat. Life risk and tefillah betzibur. That's it. And then I would be more than happy to encourage people to come with a car on Shabbat. Why? Because Hashem said so. But he didn't have what to answer. Sometimes we don't think. We get angry, angry, angry. One little detail, you don't pay attention, and you have the wrong conclusion. So believe me, the advice I gave you is going to be a treasure for your life. After you read Rabbi Victor's answers, one of the questions, or many of them, relates to universities. Now, I want to remind you that in his days, 40, 50 years ago, when he wrote those answers, university was better mikdash compared to the universities today. But I want you still to read what he wrote about it 40 years ago. And then you will do a million times Kalvachomir. Million times Kalvachomir. I want to tell you one more thing. Reality shows that 85% of the people in America graduate university and do not work in what they learn at all. That means university, if it's good, it's good only for 15% of the people. There are 15% that do what they learn in university. Most of them make less than an Uber driver. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. An Uber driver that came from Uzbekistan, <laughs> or from uh, Georgia, or from Egypt, or from anywhere else in the world. Drive a taxi, listening to CDs all day of Torah. <laughs> it's like sitting in yeshiva. Ten hours a day, he hears drashot. He makes 60, 70,000 years. If he's a limo driver, it can be even 120. <laughs> Fancy car. How many college graduates, artists, story, even nurses, uh, all kinds of other people make less? And they stuck with student loans with 6% interest for 20 years. <laughs> many people in America are waiting for Mashiach, but much more people are waiting for Sleepy Joe to waive their student loans. <laughs> <laughs>
How many people retail in Sleepy Joe, please, before you totally lose your mind? Wave all the student loans, we all stuck with that. Not only it did not benefit us, I still have to pay all these loans. <laughs> you know? So reality, Rabotai, look, the Torah is not just a recommendation. Get it to your head. It's instructions and orders from the one who supply you with your oxygen every minute. You don't want to get him angry at you. I want to remind you that the Rambam, not me, everything I say tonight, none of it is my opinion. I want you to think that I'm some kind of okay de hot. You know, I only use other people's brains, see the common sense, and bring it up to the, out to the, to the public. It's not that I see it and analyze it myself on some, some kind of a gaon like the Rambam or the Ramban or the Ramchal. Forget about it. I'm just a mailman. You know, mailman, he brings you a letter from uh, some big, uh, big shot lawyer. The lawyer is the one who wrote it. The mailman just deliver it. Don't hit the, the mailman. It's not his fault. Not when he delivers a nice letter, and not when he delivers a disturbing letter. He's only a mailman, right? If somebody read to you a in the Rambam, who you should be angry at? The one that reads the Rambam, or the Rambam? The answer is none of them. The mailman for sure not. But the Rambam, what, he made it up? Where did he get it? From Hashem. So you angry at Hashem? Next time when you hear something that you don't like or don't understand, you're not far from the Kotel, right? They complain and put it there to Hashem. Dear God, I made a big sacrifice. I left Brooklyn and came to Levaron, and today in Shio I found something I don't like. Maybe in a dream it will give you the answer. But until then, it doesn't mean because you don't understand, you're not going to do it. I want to remind you the words of the Rambam that are not so popular, especially not today in today's generation. Almost nobody reads it, especially not in English. The Rambam in Ilkhot Shuvah, chapter 7, Halacha 6. The Rambam talks about a Jew with his status before he became a Baal Shuvah, and after he became a Baal Shuvah. Don't say, I say, I'm telling you the words of the Rambam. Gdol Aposkim. That's how Hashem looks at you, like this. The Rambam said, Emesh, yesterday, before he became a, a Baal Shuvah, Haya, Sanui, he was hated. Meshukatz, Meruchak Vetoeva. He was hated, he was mishukat, like some kind of a worm on the floor, sheket, pushed away, an abomination in the eyes of Hashem. Basically cannot be worse. Pushed away, abomination, hated. And today, today, he left the nonsense of Brooklyn and Queens and Manhattan and five towns and Great Neck and who knows what. And he got on a plane and he sits here in the holy city of Yerushalayim, learns Torah, gets up in the morning, come to Midianim, working on his midot, changing his terrible ideology that he had from before, changing his modesty, watching his eyes, getting rid of his horrible internet nonsense that he used to be addicted to. Working on himself, it's a process. No one became tzaddik overnight. But I know from this place many boys came here, not such great tzaddikim, and came out of here with a great treasure for life. So the Rambam continued, and today, after he became a bad shuva, his love, his welcome, his, his push, pull closer, is a yadid. Yadid. He's a Yadid of Hashem. You know what Yadid mean? A friend. Hashem is my friend. Not just my father, not just my king. We are friends. What is a Yadid? Yud, Dalet, Yud, Dalet. Yad, and another Yad. Two hands shakes the hand. Yud, Dalet, and Yud, Dalet. Yadid. Friendship. Handshake. 
Yesterday you came to shake Hashem's hand. Get out of here. משוקץ, שנוי ומתועב. No, no, Hashem, I'm sorry. חטאתי, אביתי, פשעתי. Enough with the nonsense. Here, the iPhone. Boom. Here, I'm coming. I'm Shomer Shabbos. I'm coming to Shurim. I'm davening. I'm changed the way I dress. I watch my eyes. I try. I eat on this strictly kosher, I make brachot, I don't go to Ben Yehuda streets anymore. I don't care about stupid baseball and all the rest of the thing. One thing you like to do is to play sport. Oh, at least you, you improve your health. But who told you you have permission to watch all these genius NBA stars? I have a student, you all know him, his name is Omri Kaspi, you know him? Yeah. I open up his eyes to religion, Baruch Hashem, him and his wife. His two girls now go to religious uh, kindergarten, he came to, uh, to us many times while he was in New York. Stardom? No. Stardom also. But Kaspi Mamash was my personal student. So I asked him, now when you know the truth, you're listening to me daily, how do you feel among these people? He said to me, if you know how stupid and wicked they are, then you would admire me that I'm not fainting next to them. So now one of them, now one of them you have one minute conversation to have with him. All they care about is money, toys, women, and one, one other thing he say, guns. Some of them have guns. They make 30 million dollars each way. They walk with a gun. They buy a gun from some criminal. They put it in a car. What do you need a gun? You make 20 million dollars a year. He said to me, you cannot have one conversation about anything important without one of them. They make 10 million, they lose 15 million that deals. Except one player that has a head on his shoulder. Who is it? Bron. No. Kerry. <laughs> so Kerry is the only one in the NBA that has values. Man of the family, believe in God, his mother religious. I believe J.C. Penny, but at least they have some faith. You know? <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Follow me. Time is running out, so we don't have that much time left. You know, there is halacha that goy, that oved kochavim umazalot chayav mita. Meaning, it has to be executed. What does that mean? What does that mean? In English. Words, in English. Some goyim, they used to bow down to the sun, to the moon, to the stars, to the cow, to a lot of idols. It's called avodazara. Idol worshiping. So the Rambam said, in the beginning, their grandparents, they did not really worship the sun and the moon and the stars. They knew that Hashem gave power into the horoscope. That this month and this day and this hour, depending where you're born, it's affecting your mazal. Even though the Jewish nation is above the mazal, but the goyim are under the supervision of the movements of the stars, what they call horoscope and the signs and all that. So they gave a lot of respect to the messengers of God, which is the sun, the moon, the star. But after a few generations, the mistake started that the grandchildren already worshipped the stars. Just like today in Judaism, the Torah say you have to admire the Talmidei Chachamim, you have to support them, you have to respect them, they always come first, and you're allowed to be jealous with them, maybe one day you'll be like them. There's a lot of things. And if it's your rabbi, and if it's someone who made you bad tshuva, you owe him your life, there's a lot, of, a lot of things that are written about it. The problem is that some followers of a specific rabbi became his idol worshippers. He became their god. They already forgot about Hashem. He is their God. He is daven to him to be mezavek zivugim to my children, daven to my rebbe to give me parnasa. That's already a good azara. 
No difference than this going down onto the sun. So the Rambam speaks about this goyim who worship the kohavim. What's their punishment according to the Torah? Dead. Now I want to ask you a question. You have over here Itzik from Tel Aviv. Itzik from Tel Aviv. Itzik from Tel Aviv has 12 earrings on his eyebrow and another five on his nose. He has a horse tail in the back. His entire body are all kinds of kishkushim, kakuim, pictures. You, don't, you do not find skin anymore. He has a jeans all the way down with lots of holes. And he smoke, you know what? And he walks up like this in the street. And then you have Mr. Lee from China who gets up in the morning, look up to the sun, and goes like this. Dear God, thank you for giving me life. Thank you for giving me my wife. Thank you for giving me a few kids. Thank you that we have rice to eat and vegetables. <laughs> now, now, you look at this Mr. Lee, and you look at Itzik from Tel Aviv. Let's be honest, who's worse? If you have to make a partnership with one of them, to put him in charge of your cash register in your restaurant, who would you like? Itzik <laughs> or Mr. E? <laughs> God willing. Oh, who is Hashem like that? Oh, wait, wait. Oh. Huh? <laughs> who would you like to be your partner? Mr. D. I say, I say, if it was up to me, the Chinese guy that bowed down to the sun and believed that sun is God is a million times better than this guy, than Itzik. At least he's looking for God. What does he know from his life? He went to yeshiva? Someone sent him to Jerusalem to sit in a place and learn the principles of life? He grew up in some village in China and he, he's thinking, who made this world? It has to be a God. Has to be. So you look, you see a huge ball of fire in the sky. Common sense, without knowing Torah. If you grew up in some jungle and you don't know about religion anything, but you know if there is a creation, there is a creator. And the creation is very sophisticated. So it indicates about the ability of the creator. So you want to do something for that creator. Please, thank you for making me, thank you for giving me food. So you're thinking that it's the sun. So you bow down to the sun every day and pray, and what does the Torah say? You chayav mita. You have to be executed for that. Even the shogeg. Imagine what's going to be the end of those Jews who rebel every second of their life against Hashem. Tel Aviv, parties. You're allowed to walk in Tel Aviv? Who, who say that a kosher Jew is allowed to walk there? The filthiest city in the world. Where you take Kadosh, you take Kadosh. Huh? At Mat Tel Aviv, you take Kadosh. At Mat New York, Adama. Shabbat Shalom. Depend where in New York. There it's a Kadosh. Nahon. New York is a little Kadosh. Nahon. Yeah. Nahon. But tell me now, where a Jew is allowed to walk? In Monsi or Lakewood or in Tel Aviv? Where it's Israel. Yarden, Syria, Lebanon, there it's Israel. Nahon. Ava, let me ask you a question. If you had now a choice to live with your wife and children in Monsi or in Lakewood, or to, or to live in Tel Aviv with all the gays over there, where would you like your children to grow up? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, don't run away from the question. <laughs> you gotta choose from Monsi to Tel Aviv. <laughs> You got the point. I want to refresh your memory. Is the Gemara say that when the Mashiach come, all the yeshivot and the synagogues will be carried by Hashem to Eretz Israel, and the din of the yeshivot of Chutz Laaretz it's like the din of Eretz Israel. So, okay. Now. Yeah, how'd you get here? Tel Aviv airport, no? No, it's not in Tel Aviv. Here it's Lut. 
So the idea of what I'm saying to you is you finally made a huge step in your life. Remember, you deserve all the admiration in the world. And I 100% mean what I say. You do, you do. You do. You are, you are the pride of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Trust me, even more than people who learn all their life in Yeshivot Torah. Because they were born into it. For them it was natural. But for you, you came from where you came, and you made that step, and you deserve a great chazak uvaruch nishat Aval, aval, I say, if you do it, do it right. Meaning, once you hear, really shtaik seriously. Put your life into the place, into the gmarot, into alachot. Do not go, not to Ben Yehuda Street, and definitely not to Tel Aviv and not to secular places, stay away from the girls around, even if she's your cousin, she comes with her, stay away from all this. <laughs> Try to stay away from your phone. Better not to, because the problem is you get holy, you get inspired in yeshiva, three, four hours, you're full of fire, you feel close to Hashem, then you go to this stupid thing and it's, you travel all over the wicked world. What you gain, you lose. What you gain, you lose, like the water. The water gets almost boiling and goes down to zero. Goes up, go down. Two years there, in the end you go back to university and Hashem Yerachem, what's going to come out of you. <laughs> but some people did actually do it right. We had a, we had a guy in the Shiva, if you see him today, in the wildest dream you would not believe when I show you his picture, how he was before he became a Belgian. He came to Yeshiva, <coughs> 20 something years ago, 25 years ago, was a bodybuilder training all kinds of celebrities. He found out the Torah, he came to one city yeshiva, he sat almost 18 hours a day learning. There was no lunch break for him, someone brought him a little sandwich, what he was eating, what he learned from early in the morning until midnight every day. He was very serious. Today, is Av Bedin of Bet Shemesh, Shochet, Moel, Sofer Stam, one of the best, genius Talmid Chacham, every halacha in Shulchan Aruch he knows by heart, include all the Nosei Kelim and Farshim, the entire Shas he finished few times. You have to see when he walks in the street how people in their 80s come to give their brachot from him and kisses him. When they wanted, when he wanted to go into the Bedin, the Dayanim over there were in their 70s, and he was in his 40s. <laughs> it looks a little bit like a joke, ma. You want to be a Dayan with us here? So they told him, no, it's not Shayach. So he asked his rabbi to talk to them. The rabbi, he's not rabbi, he's not rabbi, of parents. He called up the Dayanim, and so what's the problem? So he's too young, he's inexperienced, what? Everyone here is 70 and up. So he said to them, I'm willing to do a test with you. I'm going to come tomorrow to Bedin, and I'm going to test you in all Choshen Mishpat. If there will be one halacha that he will not know better than all of you, don't accept it. Every question you want. He wrote already a few, few books in Choshen and Mishpat. You have to see the Askamot that Rav Yitzchak Yosef and Rav David Yosef and many others gave him. The light of the generation. He started where you are right now. That was the first step. For Israel, Evaro, Mikdash, same idea. 
That means each one of you can be like this. Now what about Parnassa? What about Parnassa? He has a house, he has two cars, Mazda SUV for his wife, and a brand new Hyundai, the big ones. He has a nice salary, and everything he wants is done for him. Melechet tzadikim naaset bide acherim. When Hashem saw such devotion, he introduced him to a very rich guy who has a hundred stores in America, selling all kinds of beach wares. I don't know what exactly he says. That guy made aliyah to Bet Shemesh. They became friends. He supported his kolel. The whole kolel the guy paid for. Support him. Bought him an apartment. Bought him two cars. Why? He bought him. Hashem bought him. Same thing I say to each one of you. You don't need to be Rasha to make Parnassah. You don't need to sit with her heresy people and Kofrim, infidels and gays and Sone Hashem and lefties in order for you to make a living. Get it out of your head. It's Kfira. Anyone who thinks that the only way to make a living is by sitting in these places with this Reshaim, he himself is not religious. A religious guy is allergic to them. I can even be, I, I come next to these people, I want to vomit. And I'm nothing holy. If I was holy, I would faint and die. Now I'm only vomiting. Someone real holy? cannot even breathe next to these people. The nonsense they talk about, the way they behave, man became a woman, woman became a man, you don't know anymore who, who is a Jew, who is not a Jew, who is normal, who is a psycho. <laughs> I have to sit with them now for four or five years with this Reshaim of Sdom, hoping you're going to make a living, and you don't trust Hashem to feed you, he feeds the Indians that bow down to the cow. He won't feed you, the graduate of Lerao, what do you think? And I will finish with a story that hopefully will give you an inspiration. We had a guy, he also moved to Bet Shemesh. This guy, he came to our yeshiva, very pedantic person, organized, yeke, Sfaradi, but mamash yeke. But he was serious. He learned, 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 learned. After six months he was in yeshiva. One time he calls me up, I'm in Brooklyn tonight. Can you give me a ride back to Muncie? I say, yeah, but it's gonna be late, after midnight. Say, Anytime. Around one, it's good for you? I say yes. He said yes. We are driving now to Muncie. One, one, one thirty a.m. What time is it in Israel? 8.30 in the morning. He says to me, a few days I'm leaving, I'm going to Israel. I say, why? You're going so nice in yeshiva now, you're not ready yet. You need at least another year here. You're on the way up. You don't throw something like this now. Where is he going to go in Israel? His parents from Adar Yosef, there's nobody religious over there. It's from Tel Aviv. That's a dead sentence for his neshama. So I said to him, did you ask the Rosh Hashimah? He said, yes, but it's not that I want to go. <coughs> Believe me, the last thing I want is to go. I love it every minute here. But my visa will get expired. If I don't, if I don't leave, I won't be able to ever come back to America. You know, it's a famous problem. So I said to him, you know, I just remember that one time I gave a lecture in Brooklyn, and it was an Israeli girl there. And she told me that she goes back and forth as much as she wants, even though she went over the, the limit of her visa. She keeps coming in. I ask her, how do you do it? If you stay more than six months, you get burned for 10 years. How do you go in and out? She said, I found a trick. I don't know if this trick is still available, but back then it was. That's what I'm talking to you about 15 years ago, this story. She said, I buy a ticket to Canada, Montreal or Toronto, with a stop in New York. I, I replace, I, I come, I land in JFK, and then I have to go to Air Canada 
to go to Montreal. But where is my connection from La Guardia? I land in JFK and I make sure that the next flight will be from La Guardia to Canada. When I come, the guys say, what, why do you come to America? I say, I didn't come to America, I'm going to Montreal, here. Here's my flight. So he lets you enter because you have to go to La Guardia. You enter in the United States, you put the La Guardia ticket in the garbage, caparat avonot. <laughs> I told her, you sure? Yes. One time I had a couple that they wanted to go to Israel, maybe 15 years they didn't go to Israel. This couple, I made them ballet tshuva, you know who they are? They funded the party in the Knesset called Shinui, Shem Reshaim Irkav. Yair Lapid and his father. They brought his father, the Haman Arasha, into the Knesset. Two Ashkenazim that did not hear one word of Torah in their entire life until I went to speak in Nichum Avelim. People were sitting Shiva and there were guests there. And they got the shock of their life. They came to me after the lecture and said, it's the first time we heard words of Torah, and we are shocked. We were so much against Judaism and Torah, we opened the party to fight the Torah and the, the religious people. We brought Tommy Lapid, Shem Reshaim Yerka, into the Knesset because we couldn't make it on our own. So we gave him the party. And now we just realized the mistake we made. So I said to them, can you make me a lecture in your house and invite all your friends? Yes. That's how I started to become friendly with them. They became Ale Tshuva. So I told them there's a way to go to Israel. So she went with the same trick. She came back. He went the same thing. It worked. Now we're already at Chazaka. The girl, the wife, and the husband. So the guy sitting with me in a car at 1.30 at night, I say to him, you will be able to come back to America. Why? You're gonna, you're gonna do the same thing. He said, ah, I don't wanna take that risk. Maybe it won't work for me. What do you think happened now at 1.30? This is after years that I did not see the girl. Years. I get a phone call, unavailable number. 1.30 at night, who calls at such a time? Hello? Hi, Kvodav. Remember me? Wow, Moran. Which Moran? You gave a lecture in a house in Brooklyn. Da, da, da. I say, you're the one who gave me that idea about coming to America with a ticket to Canada, right? She say, yes, all done. I'm just talking to someone about you. <laughs> Here. Put her on the speaker. He said, ah, I cannot be. You, made, you planned it. I promise you. Years, I, I had forgot about her existence. And just because of you, I remember her, and she called. <laughs> she told him that it works, and she keeps doing it. And he agreed to stay in Yeshiva. What do you think happened next? He was supposed to go to Israel, so his parents were waiting for him. Now when his parents found out he's not coming, they want to come to visit him in Monsi. So he asked me, can my parents stay by you for a week? I said, yes. His father and his mother came to my house. That week, they asked me, there is a girl from Chicago, she's looking for a place to stay in Muncie for three weeks. She will help your wife. Would you be able to host her in your house? I said, yeah. So the girl came, the parents of this guy came. I see his father checking her out like this. <laughs> I said to him, Benny, I read your mind. I said, don't you think she's good for my son? I said, she's perfect for you. You just gave me a great idea. We made a shiduch between them. They got married. They made aliyah. We have to see what a Ben Torah this guy is. Everything worked out for him. What do you think would happen if he would go back to Israel six months after he was in Yeshiv? What do you think would happen? If he would be married to Goya, I would not be surprised. Yes, Adam kone olamo berega echad. You can buy your eternity in one moment of a decision, or chas v'shalom to lose it in a minute of a decision, bad decision. And the decision you already made one correct one is to come to Yerushalayim to learn, but it's not enough. You need a follow-up. 
גדרל אוף דה בד, סור מרע, סור מרע, גדרל אוף דה בד פונס, גדרל אוף דה בד אנביירמנט, דו נאט גו טו פלייסס לייק תל אביב, דו נאט גו טו אול קיינדס אוף פארטיס אוף אמריקאנס, נו ירסיב, דיס, אול דיס שטויות, קאד אל אוף יור לייף, ואני חופפולי יהיו בי סמארט אינף נאט טו וייסט דה מנט אוף יור לייף, טו גו אינטו יוניברסיטי ונברן יור נשמה דר, חופפולי. I know sometimes it's your parents' decision, not yours. I know. What can we do? But you have to be strong. It's your life. Chayech HaKodmin. You have to tell your parents, listen, I'm going to suffer every day. I don't want to do it. I want to be Ben Torah. Don't worry, if you be a big Talmud Chacham, you can make much more money than a nurse. I promise you. The ever least in Israel. The ten richest rabbi of Israel. Of Israel, not of America. The one in top of the list. How much money they found in his bank account? Throw a number. 1.4 billion shekel in cash. <laughs> the poorest one on the list. Huh? How much? 30 million dollars. The number 10. And what do you think? These rabbis go to work, they take care of all kinds of Arabs in the hospital. Kof! Kof! Ahmed! Kof! Laude! Zeha! Give me your knee! Boom! Ay! You Yahud, you hate me! You hit too hard! Doctor, I'm getting married tomorrow to my husband. My husband's name, I'm Avi and he's Isaac. We would like to invite you to our chupa. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> One guy is, in, is giving shots, vaccines in Florida. He said to me, Rabbi, I'm giving vaccines all day from morning to night. One guy came, shaved head, big gorilla. I say, lift your sleeve. What do I see? A swastika sticker and a picture of Adolf. <laughs> Nazi. He said, I gave him the vaccine. After he left, I started to think maybe I broke the halacha. Am I allowed to give vaccine to someone like this? Yes. Yeah. I said to him, the halacha is that should have given him poison that he should die in an hour. That's the halacha. No, you're going to be a doctor. You have to take care of someone like this. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Here in Israel it's like this. You don't have to be in America. Here, here, over here, half of the patients here are Arabs, Sone Israel. Sone Israel. You're going to have to take, you're going to have to work with them. You're going to have to work with Arab nurses over here. With Arab colleagues. That's going to be a doctor here, or in America, same story. What about a lawyer? Depends what kind of a lawyer. Most lawyers are illegal, according to the Torah. Criminal lawyers is not allowed. Family lawyer is not allowed. Uh, real estate is allowed. Finance. Finance is allowed. But criminal is not allowed. You put in rapists on the street, murderers on the street, you have to defend all kinds. Family is also not allowed because the laws of the United States are against the Torah. Like this Hasidi should judge. Every day, every second of her life is Chilul Hashem, and she has to go against Hashem's constitution because she, had, she works for the United States. So she has to put innocent Jews in prison, and she has to let murderer Arabs out, and that's what she does all day, getting Hashem angrier by the minute. You want to end the same like her? It's a moiser. Someone, by the way, should know to be a lawyer that you have to go to trial. <laughs> According to Allah, you're not allowed to step inside the secular court or Goish court. You're not allowed to sue any Jew in a secular court, only in a bad deal. Now, what happens if you're a prosecutor? Every second of your life is a crime. You have to call Jews into the court and attack them. So every second of your life will be a crime. To make $100,000 a year, you want to be the biggest criminal. Someone that is a moisture, you cannot count him in a minyan. You know, if a criminal lawyer comes into the shul, you cannot count him as one of the ten. 
if a judge with a keeper on comes into the shul, you cannot count him as one of a minyan. Rav Ovadi Yosef has a big answer about it. You're not allowed to put mezuzah in a court. You're not allowed to put mezuzah over there. It's a makom of a war against Hashem. It's a mamash storm in the middle of town. So if you're defending someone from the government, no. At least you try to save someone. The idea is the only kosher lawyers are business and real estate and finance. They work in an office, they don't go to trial, it's clerk. Government, this, accounting, things like this. Okay, it's nothing illegal. You don't go against the chain. You don't have to go, but I'm saying, why investing 10 years of your life for it when you can make much more money being a salesman? Get a good product or work in real estate and make business. All you have to do is to do ishtadlut. Do ishtadlut. You're going to make enough money to live, Rabotai. What about business college? Is it kosher? Or the same professor? It's more, it's more, it's more. I heard that Lander College is good. Yeah, Toro, Toro. Toro, 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 but it can create Chilul Hashem. They know you're Jewish and you charge them 40, 50, 60 percent interest a year, can bring the Holocaust on us. That's what happened in Poland. The Jews were in finance, they're killing them on finance fees. And once the, after the Holocaust finished, the survivors went back to their homes and who do you think killed them? The Polish. They took access and split their head open. They asked them after the war, why did you do such thing after the war? They were suffering so many years in, in camps, and, and then in the end you ended up killing them. So we just could not even imagine that we're going to be again under the influence here in finance and what they did to us before the war. We were so terrified that we had to go and finish the job. Understand? Remember, when a guy see that a Jew makes money, even if it's nothing to do with him, it drives him crazy. It's in the Torah. What brought the Holocaust of Egypt to the Jewish nation that they put all of them in camps? When they left Goshen and they moved all over Egypt. The Torah said, Malar Etzotam. What was the retaliation of the Egyptians? Soon they're gonna join together with our enemies and take over Egypt. Let's put them in camps. What? As long as the Jews were in Goshen, everyone was happy with the Jewish community, the Egyptians did not look at them. So that's what I'm doing money. So that's not cash advance, so I sell a shirt, they're going to hate me. What's the difference? Yeah, okay. Again, first of all, when you make a lot of money, you do not want to show the goim around you that you're very successful. Who told you you have to drive a Bentley, or a Ferrari, or expensive Mercedes, or BMW? Drive a Toyota. Why take the eyes of the of the goyim that barely makes a living and they see a Jew with a yarmulke drives a nice Mercedes or what? What do you think is happening to their mind when they see it? They look at that as you came to America and took away our wealth, like the sons of Lot. Yaakov worked like a slave, slave, 20 years. In the end he got what he deserved and they say he stole everything from us. He hates us anyways. But he doesn't know. Wait. Of course, a sub sonel Yaakov. But as long as the going make money and they don't see that the Jew make money, they won't touch you. Yeah. When they suffer financially and they see Jews around them celebrating, that's when the problem is. You understand? So can you confirm cash rates now up? So can can you confirm that cash rates now up? I can say that because technically, if you give a loan to someone and you agree to pay the interest, the goy, I cannot say not allowed, but I say it can create a big problem. It ruins a person's midot as well. It ruins a person's midot as well. So you used to like, yeah, you know, they switch up the. You see, the Torah say do not charge interest from a Jew, but the Torah also say ve goy tashir. So if Hashem thought that charging interest from another person ruins your personality, then he would not allow to do it with Goim as well. 
The fact that he said that someone mefarshim said that it's mitzvah to charge interest from a goy. Not just that it's allowed, that it's mitzvah. But at the same time, you can also pay interest to the goy. It works both ways. A Jew took a loan from a goy, he can pay him interest. So the goyim cannot say, oh, what kind of a Torah you have such a racist Torah? So from a brother Jew, you don't allow that to charge interest. But from us, you're killing us on interest. So the answer would be, no. You can also give me loan and I will pay you interest. It works both ways. So then when they hear it, they relax. Oh, okay, okay, I got it. I get all these questions a lot from Goyim. Goyim listens to a lot of lectures on YouTube. Yeah, Rabbi, do you believe that the future and destiny of, of the Jewish people is only here in the land of Israel and nowhere else? You are strong into Zionism, I see. Yes. The only Chazaka. My rabbi was a Zionist. Meir Kahana was my rabbi. Meir Kahana was a great person. I loved him very much as he a kid. He spoke the truth. A hundred percent. That's why I love him, because he was not politically correct. Exactly. Yes. So, first of all, we're already friends, you and me. Shabbat <laughs> Shabbat I'm good. also Sephardi, just like you. Ah, very good. Baruch Hashem. My mother was from North Africa. So, uh, first of all, definitely, in the end, all Jews will have to come to Eretz Israel. It's a prophecy. However, let me tell you something. And we'll finish really here, because I got to run. I have a lecture in, in where? Tel Aviv. Hashem. <laughs> Tel Aviv. Anyway. I want to tell you something. Every human being that wants to make Aliyah has to go to his personal rabbi and tell him exactly his condition. Him, his wife, his children, in yeshivot, and tell him where he wants to go. And the rabbi has to analyze the situation. Shh, another minute and we're done. Analyze the situation and make a psak alakha. You can make aliyah or not yet. Why? Everybody understand that it's better in Eretz Israel than in Galut. However, sometimes if a family has a good job, good parnasa, kids in good yeshivot, and they have shalom bayit, and they have good uh, community, everything works for them. They're not allowed to gamble leave everything that they have right now, come here, even though it's mitzvah to live in Eretz Israel, but you don't know where you're going to put your kids, what yeshivot will accept them, what synagogue you will have, who's going to be your rabbi, what parnasa you're going to make here. A lot of the Americans family, many of them, unfortunately were very inspired to do aliyah, and Eretz Israel destroyed them, not the land, the environment. They did not find Parnassa, they did not find community, their kids were not accepted in yeshivot, they went off the derer, some of them died from drugs. What? Some of them even came back to America after spending $100,000 back and forth on tickets. Why is it? Because not, you don't just go, whatever happened, happened. The Gemara says, Bari v'shema, Bari adif. If you have a guarantee parnasa, guarantee children in yeshivot, guarantee shalom bayit, guarantee good community, you don't gamble, maybe I will have the same in Israel. It's a big risk. If in America you don't have anything, no parnasa, barely shalom bayit, the kids are not in yeshivot, then for sure. What's the question? If you suffer here, you might as well suffer here financially. At least you're in Eretz HaKodesh. Right. Then there's no dilemma. But someone that is right now in exile and his children are learning very good or sometimes you have old parents that he takes care of in New York, you cannot just get up and leave. You have to ask that Torah. I don't say yes, I don't say no. You have to ask your own rabbi. Rabbi, this is my situation. He's going to ask you 50 questions. What about this? Where are you going to live? Which? Did you find out? Did you find the location? He has to know all the details. It's the Nenefashot. With all the love we have to the Holy Land, life comes before Eretz Israel. Chacham Ovadia Yosef Pasak. Pikuach Nefesh Doche Yeshuv Haaretz. If you're going to die for sure, well, you know, you're going there to be one week in Israel and someone put a bullet in your head? No, you're not allowed to do such thing. So therefore, Abotai, you have to ask a big Chacham, and whatever he say, that's what he's going to do. I don't say yes, I don't say no, every person is a different answer. 
depend on his situation. Last question for today, please. Uh, I watched a couple of the rabbi's videos, and uh, I'm quoting from the videos, okay? The rabbi was speaking about wrestling. And the rabbi was saying that what Rabbi Nachman says about clapping hands in the prayer, the rabbi said, The rabbi said, I'm quoting, yeah? And the rabbi said, do you, know, do you know how it's amazing how a person hear and understand what he wants to understand? Now I'm going to tell you exactly what I said. I was talking about one Breslev hippie. You don't have to say his name. But this is how he prayed. Listen. <laughs> He was clapping hands in the prayer. Don't tell me how. I saw exactly what he does. And then other people like this. And then many of the people over there are drug addicts. They play trance music and jump like zombies all night. You understand? I say that's Chilul Hashem. That's not the way to come to the synagogue and stand in front of Hashem. Then somebody asked, what about it Bodedut? I said Bodedut was from the time of Yitzhak Avinu. They did not invent it, but they do it like they try to steal the credit on it. One more thing I say, every day we do it, but they do it three times. Stand in Tfilat Shmona in front of Hashem and spill our heart. <laughs> That's it, but they do it. Close your eyes and ask. So why do I need to go and scream in the middle of the night, Tate, I fail! What's this shtuyot? You can stand in front of Hashem no matter where you are. You don't need to go in the middle of the night and put a show and Nafalti, I'm dying. That's not the way. So the rabbi said, Shema Shel Abinach, what is the shkuyot? Where does it say such a thing to go like this and to dance and to take drugs and to play? I'll tell you what, if you dive in a minyan and someone next to you start going like this, it distracts everyone else. If you pray at home, clap as much as you want. Call them in your house, okay? Distract the person. It distracts. People move chairs, this. It distracts people. People talk in the middle of the evening. People lose their uh, concentration. I would like to thank you very much again. <laughs> שנאמר אדוני חפץ ומען צדקו יגדיל תורה ויעתיד קדל להתקדש מרבה על מה אני נורא כירותי ועמדים מלכותי ועצמם פוקני ויקרים ושכני נכון יום נכון נופל לכל בית ישראל בעגלה בזמן קריב יבוא אמן Amen.